So today is uh, March 29th. This is the hopefully last meeting of the Public Safety Committee and Working Group uh, to review the recommendations in the CNA report. Um, uh, it's uh, 5.05. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the agenda. Um, uh, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. I'll second that. All those in favor, please say aye. I, aye. Uh, we have an agenda. The second item on the agenda is uh, the approval of the Public Safety Committee minutes for March 22nd. Um, Soraya, have you, did you have a chance to look at them? I just did, but um, this isn't really a minutes thing, but just because this is where we're keeping our thing, is in the up-to-date spreadsheet. Um, I'm not seeing the committee notes on four, section four, five, six, and seven. I I'm I noticed that as well. Um, don't know what. And I went back had. to Zariah, the one that you had sent last week as the most up to date, and I didn't see them there either. And I don't know. I should have flagged that. Um. Okay. So in what I sent you, what did we take notes over last time? Six and seven and six, eight? eight? Or six, seven, and nine. Six, seven, and nine. Um, um, no, and was then, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you took on on not on sevens, right? I think most of them were. Um, I mean, you came up with something that basically talked about the the need for focus on issues until staffing was mm -hmm. we in a better place with staffing. Mm -hmm. And section four was that the day where I was gone? So that was when that was Jane. Jane did four, and she sent that to you because I remember her sending that, Jared, because right. she copied me yeah, she like sent it literally right after. Yeah. I do remember that as well. So um, if we can, um, because we did three, she did three. So those are her notes on this right here, the, on, on the thing that I'm looking at myself, the one that's just spreadsheet as of 322. Um, section three, um, mm, yes. Zariah, did you miss that one? Did she do section three? Because that looks like her notes, not yours. I, yeah, I think three and four, I thought were the same. Oh, maybe they weren't. I'm trying to remember the difference between reading something and <laughs> talking about it is, uh, turns out not that clear. Um, so I do have the ones from last time where we did seven. And I guess that's it because we didn't take notes on nine so i'll just send those to you jared sorry for the confusion do you, do you know what happened what happened to four and five yeah and six is missing too On which we did the time before right yeah i could go back on board docs and look at our minutes from those. All right, so when we, so after, Jared, if we have some time, if you have any time, after we've adjourned tonight, let's see that because I've got to integrate that into the report. Yep. And I sort of need the, I need those committees. We want to make sure they're all there, I, yeah. Right, because um, that's, oh. that's sort of part of the final work product. So, um, all right, so we've got, I know we did seven, um i've got seven i see that i have them and just so we know we didn't actually review line 116 and 117 is what i put in the lines 116 and lines 117 but other than that we've got notes on section seven okay um line 115 and lines okay all right um so where we were at for the last at the last meeting um, was in my in my earnest attempt <laughs> to finish section nine. Hi, Milo. Um, in our 
in our in my earnest attempt to fi finish section nine at that meeting, there were um, there were five recommendations. Um, I think what you know we I think what we had gotten to was we had left off with. Jeff had made a, you know, a comment that, you know, the public, the community policing and also strategies as well as involvement with the community engagement needed to include, you know, the business community and downtown merchants. Um, and we sort of left off with that because um, we really didn't finish it. And I think the way we had sort of left it was if people had any other comments related to community engagement um, that we would discuss them at the beginning of this meeting. Um, I was the one that had said, I thought it was probably, these were probably fairly, ones that were fairly uh, not controversial, um, that most people agree that we need public, we need community engagement, but if there were other things, because and we did not, I don't recall that we even had, committee conclusions in here. So um, if there are any thoughts about that, I mean, just in a global way or by, you know, one through five, um, we should probably do those and try to do those by 5.30. Um, were, there, were there any additional comments? And we got yours, Jeff. Um, you know, I had put some things on there. Mostly I just said completely agree. Um, uh, were there any other comments about that? Okay. I mean, I don't want to rush through it. I mean, it still is an important section if there's other things that we should include or, um, you know, and there was fairly good agreement I'm trying to remember, I think, uh, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, BPOA did not have any responses to those notes. I, I'm, Oren, is it fair to say that you didn't have responses mostly because you just agree? Or I mean, is that a is that a fair is that a fair assumption or or no? That's a fair assumption. Okay. Um, so without that, we should probably try to get ourselves through section seven, which is a fairly no section eight. That's where we are. We're on specialized and alternative responses. Um, Karen, sorry to, I just want to make sure. sure. Yes, of course. If, really as the, assigned, as the assigned note taker, I just feel weird leaving anything blank. So I think, I guess the section nine things fall into, and folks can disagree, but I feel like it folks falls into three kind of buckets. The first bucket being like general community engagement. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm remembering this wrong. I feel like they had some specific ones on um, new American populations, but no, I'm not. Um, oh yeah. And maybe it's just the last one. Conduct outreach with refugee population. Yeah. Um, Okay, so one of them is about community engagement. Generally, so incorporating it to its strategic plan, changing how the department thinks about it, looking at some other departments, and then the um, the last one is kind of the only specific one. And so I guess it's just in terms of both like suggested timelines and committee conclusions, do we wanna treat those differently? Should I just say like, you know, maybe next year when the department feels like it has, oh, and actually, sorry, I think I'm just not seeing that the chief said done. So I guess, do we agree that it's done and or? Um, okay, yep. Um, I think that, um, all right, so I don't know, we can take these in order. Um, I think the first item is really just sort of a, to some degree, sort of a bit of a declaration that um, 
you know, community policing strategies allow for positive relationship building. I mean, that's that's just a, a statement of fact. Um, uh, proactive um, engagement encourages one-on-one -on -one relationship building. Um, I didn't really know where to go with that, um, except that mm -hmm. we agree. Um, the others are um, community policing embedded within the BPD culture at the forefront of all daily operations. Again, certainly that is true. I don't know. I don't know if you say anything that involves something that is ongoing is done. I think it's just we're doing it is more is more the, the way that I would categorize it as opposed to done. Um, and um, addressing problems of concern with the local community. Um, uh, and maybe chief, oh yeah, they did divide into two buckets, 9.1 and 9.2. I don't know if you can speak to like 9.1.3. Because I know BPD does informal events like the creamy with a cop and whatnot, but I'm not sure that that really is the same as what this is referring to. So I guess I don't know. Um, I, I think that we, so in 2020, uh, we lost our budget to do creamy with a cop. Uh, that was a line item strikeout. Um, during the, the budget negotiations, as was our barbecue budget. Uh, that was partially returned in, in 2020, uh, in, in the current fiscal year, but the summer, we simply didn't, we had neither resources nor, not, not monetary resources, but we didn't have the staffing uh, or, or things were still in flux owing to the pandemic with regard to restarting those very important uh, efforts. I, I, we certainly would be interested in doing those, um, I, I don't know that that's exactly what was being discussed in 9.1.3. I'm pretty sure that was, again, more along the lines of, of the, what the police commission is. And I do think the police commission has been talking about uh, making some changes to where they go and how they work. Um, they are broadcast on town meeting TV. They're publicly warned. They are announced in front porch forum. I mean, I think a lot is done to make the public aware of this opportunity and the degree to which the public takes advantage of it is to a certain extent, uh, the public. Great, yeah, I agree that I don't think the informal events is what's being talked about here. I'm also not sure that the police commission, at least as it exists, like I don't think that, um, like just like I don't think the public safety committee is somewhere where this specifically happens, specifically I think around the language of like feeling heard, like coming to understanding expecting members of the public to just follow police commission meetings and all their technicalities and everything else that's going on and then coming to understanding from that or feeling heard from that I don't think is I don't think that's the right and so I think it's one thing if we're saying the police commission is going to try to start hosting like annual somethings um and I would hope and assume that the police department would be a partner in that that's like where is public safety going? And I know we tried to do that a little bit as a joint committee um, last year and had a mix of technical difficulties and all kinds of other things with our consultants. But I think that's more of the, like to have an avenue for doing this that's neither informal to the, like, to the degree of like barbecues and creamies, but also isn't as formal as our traditional committee structure. And I just, and I think I do wanna talk about these sections because I do think that's important in terms of rebuilding trust and yeah. Like I think it's something like what we're doing but on a bigger scale. Um, thanks. Uh, Milo, did you wanna add something? Yes, thank you. Um, I definitely agree with what was just said. When I look at 9.13, I don't look at that as being related to the police commission at all. Um, I look at that as being overall within these several suggestions, creating extra opportunities for engagement that um, 
haven't previously existed and that go beyond the barbecue or the creamy with a cop, which uh, I can see are considered to be, you know, quote unquote, feel good events, but don't get uh to the root of the type of engagement that we really need in this city to increase trust. You know, you can have a wonderful afternoon with the community. You can give out free food. You can give, you know, six-year-old kids ice cream, but what happens when they're 16 years old, right? So I'm, I'm looking for other things. And I've talked about this forever, but looking for, um, substantial things that that will involve officers as well like so with the um public information officer position you know i was looking at that to, you know the quick description that was written for it and i was like wow it needs to go deeper because whoever accepts this position they need to be looking at a description that is really properly explaining what is expected of the position in terms of community engagement. So I I don't look at some of these as a, a including what the police commission is doing because um, as Ariya said it, it, it's it's different. Um, we we want to take it to the ne- to the next level. Um, I've got tons of ideas. I just need someone to say there there will and and there are ideas that can be done now that can be done now despite the uh, staff shortage. I think it's just something that we need to start to move forward with with increments. I wouldn't consider them done. Um, I would say that there's a lot that needs to be added and I think it's something that should always be looked at as ongoing. Thank you. Well, you know, when you put it that way, Milo, I mean, I think maybe, um, I mean, I would tend to agree with both of you that um, this, this recommendation is not about the police commission. Um, I do think that um, I do think that we all, and when I say we all, I mean all of us as members of this community are each in a great position, given the fact that we all travel in many different circles, to be able to um, uh, have an opinion, and you know, and in many cases a very educated opinion um, about uh, what it will take for all parties to be seen, heard, and understood. And that's really what this is this is all about. Um, you know, I mean, on a on one level, I do think that a public information officer will that could be one of their roles which is why I think it's really important that they have one. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I think there is a place for those feel good moments. Um, they've been, I, my understanding is they're very successful. I've been to a couple of them. They were extremely well attended a couple of years ago. Um, and I think, um, you know, opportunities for, um, the, uh, um, Oh God, I'm trying to think what it's called. The, it's not called. It, it's uh, the police. Uh, the uh, police academy, I think it is, where you know civilians come in and learn about policing. Um, I mean, all of those are good opportunities for people to be engaged. Um, but I think in the, with this, it sounds to me like reaching out to those people who represent different constituencies is really what this is saying. I don't think it's, I agree, it's not about the police commission. So maybe the better, maybe the committee conclusion, if just to sort of put something out there, is that um, for all in, for all involved parties to be seen, heard, and understood, um, there needs to be direct constituent outreach to all parties. Um, and that is, that is, that can, I, I think, I think the CSLs can help with that. Um, I think that uh, um, you know outreach to constituent groups, nonprofits within Burlington, that that can help. Um, but it's an ongoing thing. It is definitely not something that I would consider to be done. I think it's an ongoing 
always evolving process. Um, just as people change, um, so does the need to have this be an ongoing project. Um, sort of like what you do, what, what, what should be done every single day. Um, so as far as the, I mean, I was a little bit stuck on the strategic plan, mostly because I, you know, I didn't, didn't really know if there is a, I mean, we'd have to go back and have a new strategic plan. I don't know if there is one. I mean, you're the, to the police commissioners, is there a, is there talk of a new strategic plan? Because I wasn't, I'm not aware of that and I'm, but I'm, but I may not know. Well, one of the things that we were talking about was moving our meetings around. It was something that we had gone into discussions about last year. Like if you take the meetings to different parts of the community, um, as opposed to, I mean, now we're having them inside Contoy's auditorium, but they used to only be at the police station, which isn't always considered a safe space for people in the community. Um, and it's not always easy to get downtown for various reasons. So could we have it one month in the South end? Could we have it in the new North end? Could we go up on UVM campus? Uh, so we were talking about that and um, I was actually kind of looking into different spaces and then everything got kind of shut down again because of the latest surge. Uh, places that normally were open for meetings were not going to be open for meetings until we got past that. So now um, that cases have been going down again, we're going to be looking back at that. Well, that would be great. I mean, so that would certainly be something that could be included in um, in 9.1.3. Um, Do you think we've said enough or do you think that we need to say more? Hannah, do you have anything you want to add? I mean, I think it's a good idea to um, connect to, to nonprofits. I did bring that up in a, one of the uh, lines for section eight um, because so many nonprofits do outreach events and there's gotta be a way to collab with um, the department, the police department on bringing them into these community outreach events. Um, and I mean, I know that certain programs that are connected to the police department do this type of stuff like tabling and such like that. I think that that's a great way to do it. Um, the one thing I would say to think about is like, you know, with the barbecue events, like I think that's great, but there's, uh, you know, a chunk of um, people that live in Burlington that would not go to that, that, um, you know, that's the chunk too, that like, you probably will have a tougher time building trust with and like would want to seek to build trust with. And they're probably more apt to get connected to other types of events. And the other thing I would say too, is like, uh, get connected to like music venues, like see if you can get in on like shows and stuff. Like, that type of community outreach where like people are just gonna be is probably a great way to do it. And maybe the same thing with like farmer's market and such um, to, to just kind of like essentially normalize uh, the presence of police, but not in a sense that like we normally think of, um, which is always associated with crime. Um, so I think that normalizing it as more of a community um, engagement um, is probably the best way to go. And I'm always like, because this is like my job, um, my day job as an organizer. So if anybody has a desire to reach out and just wants to, you know, brainstorm with me around that, I'm totally open to that. Well, that sounds like a, that sounds like an offer that nobody should turn down. Um, uh, okay. So one last question, which sure. is just making sure I think the chief made this point last time, but with the partial agreement was around the strategic plan because BPD doesn't do a strategic plan. So to do something as part of the strategic plan just doesn't make sense. Was that my understanding of the? Is there a strategic plan, um, chief, for BPD? Yeah. 
believe that this is laying out the groundwork for a lot of different changes that are going to be a component of how we move forward over the next several years. Between that and plans for that are less strategic and more tactical for deployment this summer, uh, and then very strategic plans around recruitment over the next several years. Uh, that is what is a, that's the, those are the components of where the Burlington Police Department's going. Okay. Um, so that could probably be put in here that, you know, to some degree, the CNA report, the recommendations um, and the work of this committee and the working group, um, as well as, um, you know, our overall conclusions will help to shape um, a strategic plan going forward, um, which certainly certainly indicates how important the, the work of this committee and working group are in terms of shaping what happens going forward with our police department. Um, once Ryan have time to catch up. Great, and then just on 9.1.2, just to make sure is, um, I feel like what I'm putting it, what I'm putting is, um, and this is more from my own thing, but if anybody disagrees, then I can change the notes, um, that on community oriented policing, um, I think this was happening a lot more before 2020. Um, and, you know, like as the department has capacity, they'll con continue to, implement some of those activity again, especially with the inclusion of CSOs. Does that seem fair? It does to me. And I feel good about what we have on section nine. Okay. Three minutes late, Karen, only three minutes late. Hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, all right. Well, we've got a lot in front of us with section eight. Um, so these are all, these are all related to uh, specialized and alternative responses. Um, uh, and so we'll start at the beginning. Um, key stakeholders in Burlington should be identified in a community mental health advisory committee formed. The committee must have BPT, community mental health, um, person with lived experience and advocacy groups. Um, and uh, with stakeholders high enough on the ladder to implement recommendations yet fluent with on the ground processes. Um, um, you know, it's interesting, this is, and this is mostly, um, I think the police co commissioners are aware of this, Jeff, I'm not sure if you are as much as, and also Hannah. Um, the police commission did some work very recently with a mental health summit. They wanted to have one, they brought a resolution forward. It went before the council. Um, I think it was co-sponsored by 11 of 12 of us. Um, and we have been engaged in conversations about a mental health summit. Um, initially, it was going to be led um, by the public health 
um, personnel that we have. That's with um, the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging. However, those, um, at least the one person who was really going to be leading that effort um, is leaving the city as of, I think, the 15th or so of April. Um, so there's now been discussion about that role going to um, the United Way. And the United Way has done a tremendous amount of work on uh, men mental health. And they have, they are right now hiring another person who is going to be working on that. So they have more of the resources than we do. Um, and they did say that it won't be happening in May, which is what we had hoped for, but that it would hopefully happen in June. And it would basically be a summit that would bring together um, uh, community mental health providers, people with lived experience, advocacy groups, um, really everyone that is in that list. It's not a committee, but um, just so everyone knows that that is, that is in the works. That's why I had mentioned um, that in my notes. Um, I don't know if, um, um, you know, and of course the other thing also is that uh, April 1 is the deadline for the RFP um, for the CAHOOTS model, um, the crisis team, the crisis response team, um, which means that hopefully they will be in place by, certainly by, the goal of course is for them to be on the street by summer um, when we know that there will be a lot of people out there. So, um, you know, this is this is a recommendation to have a committee. I'm, I don't I don't know if that's necessarily what we want or if we want something that is more of a um, you know a series of meetings so that we all are on the same page and everyone is talking with each other, whether this is, you know, this is a very small committee that they're talking about. I'm not sure if we're really, would be better off with something that's very similar to community stat, which is all service providers. And that's that's to do with the, um, mostly with uh, substance use disorder. So that's sort of where we are. I don't know, sorry, didn't mean to run on so long, but that's, that just want, just so everybody knows where we are with a couple of these things. Jeff, thank you. No, I was just curious, is this something that would fall under the police department's purview or would this be something in conjunction with the police department, but, but, but led by others? Um, well, the, you know, the, the, the cahoots model, the, you know, the crisis um, um, rapid response team, that would be go through dis police dispatch. That, that's, that's the model. Okay is that you know there's a call for service um it is we all know the data has shown us that many 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 of the calls are mental health related the dispatcher would then put that call that call would be rooted to that group and they would respond um and we are trying to work it out that it might not start with it being 24 seven, but the goal would be for this group to be 24 seven response. And that's the, that has been the successful decades long model in Eugene, Oregon, that is now being copied effectively in many, in other cities throughout the country. Um, but, you know, I, I I don't know how do people feel about that as far as a recommendation that we have a, that we we encourage the formation of an advisory committee, and part of that would be done through um, through cahoots the cahoots model. Um, there would have to be a, a group that was overseeing that as well, um, and that could certainly be part of the answer. If I can, yeah, I think it definitely, um, right, because the CAHOOTS model, I guess, is like the direct service provision. This is more of an advisory body, which I think isn't a bad idea. I do wonder 
like who at the city would be best to lead this. And I think Jeff's right. It's not necessarily like BPD staff. Um, I missed kind of the beginning of what you said, Karen, but I know that we had a health equity person who I think would be a good person to staff this and be like, hey, this month or this quarter or how often people meet, we're talking about this. And I don't think that position's filled right now. I assume with the changes. So I don't, I guess, I think that this is worth looking at. I feel like I would want to talk to the staff member who is in that position to be like, what would be useful? Um, and I don't think we have that person right now. So I guess maybe the recommendation could be like, once we, like once the city has a health equity manager type position again, like having a conversation with that person about like what advisory committee would be helpful based on this kind of being draft one and what support do you need from the city council and the mayor, if any, to do what you think would be the most helpful? Um, yeah, I mean, it may be a little while. I mean, why don't, so maybe that would be the, you know, because that department, you know, is a bit in flux um, and that person is leaving in mid-April, that maybe a suggested timeline would be, um, uh, you know, sometime in the fourth quarter, giving them a chance to sort of, let's see, we are in, we are just, we are just leaving the first quarter of 22. So maybe the third quarter of 22, I'm sure that there will be a strong effort to replace um, Mariel as soon as possible. Um, it's such a small group. Um, Milo, please go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to mention, um, I'm pretty much agreeing with everything that is being said, uh, but I do want to emphasize that it was something that I emphasized when we had a meeting to talk about um, what the police commission was env envisioning with regards to this summit, um, that it definitely involved a state contact as well, because there are some things that still need to be done by the state um, in order to, to help improve the situation. Um, and then part of, I kind of envisioned part of like an advisory committee is keeping track of um, incidents, keeping track of results and 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 numbers and and once our cahoots model is up and running, um, you know, tracking them as well. Thank you. Um. Okay. One of the other thing also. One of the other things also is that um, there is um, nationwide there is a group of people that are studying. Um, these cities who are just now coming out, coming forward with a CAHOOTS program. And we will be able to be part of their data collection um, to show the effectiveness of, 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 the, of that model, which is actually pretty exciting because we're gonna hopefully be there on the ground floor, which is, which is great. Um, uh, so, all right, the... Um, so the, the, the second item is about forming a statewide steering committee. Um, and I, I wasn't really sure where to go with that. I mean, they talked about um, a call center. Um, I don't know if that is something um, uh, that the call center for the state will need to be centrally, centrally involved prior to sending a 911 call. Um, I wasn't really sure where to go with that. If that was something that, uh, I mean, there seems to be agreement. I don't know, maybe for, um, you know, this is more your purview. I mean, maybe for Jabu or for Milo, if you have, um, if you have information to share on that or for the chief, um, Anyone has a, an opinion about whether or not we should, I mean, is it is it for us to decide to evaluate um, the formation of a statewide steering committee? Uh, 
a stick i i don't know that might be beyond our purview i i think i mean from my standpoint the the because we hear one thing that we've heard a lot is the commission is about the state not recognizing um although there's more money flowing now toward um mental health care there's still not the beds that are needed like getting the state to understand when it's appropriate to create a bed versus the option of putting someone in jail or in many cases as we've seen not putting someone in jail right because we know that putting them in jail doesn't solve the problem that is mental health related um so that's why we kind of felt the state needed to be involved in the conversation so that they could um hear the different types of examples and how it's really affecting what's going on in our city um you know on a daily basis with the same individuals right we know of the same individuals who are i don't even want to call them repeat offenders but they have chronic issues related to their mental health Jabu, did you want to add something to that i know you had your hand up like your real hand no uh i was just trying to, i think trying to recall it I believe was it Chittenden County or the state tried to try to consolidate um, the like the kind of like the all area nine hundred one like to one central location and I think that didn't pass um, from a, a bunch of different municipalities. So I I guess I'm just trying to look at look at like the logistics look, the logistics of all that and I think it, a it's been out of our purview and I I don't know how that would impact nine hundred one services if everything was to be consolidated. Um, Kind of based on the based on the same um, issues that I brought up when it, when it came through, I think it was like three or four years ago in the legislature. So I guess the conclusion is that um, you know that you know that we we would certainly support the formation of a statewide steering committee, um, and uh, um, would certainly contribute. You know some amount of time to helping with that, um, particularly if it is geared towards, um, uh, if it is geared towards, you know, not, not um, how do I put this? Um, if it is geared towards assisting um, with the challenges that we have, not necessarily um, just, uh, jailing people. I'm sure there's a better way to say that, but that's sort of where I just off the cuff. Um, so the, um, the um, utilizing um, the the community mental health advisory committee to review policies specifically related to recognizing and responding to persons with mental or behavioral health conditions. Um, I think that well, I know I see the I see the chief's response was very similar um, to to um to mine in terms of the mental health summit um but jabu you had said the police committee commission is currently reviewing um what two of the directives that relate to this and i oh yes and you sent them to me as well um we discussed those i think probably in section one a long time ago, quite a few meetings ago um uh I think the uh, can't imagine why there would be disagreement about that. I mean, that would be, you know, reviewing policies by from people who have that expertise would seem to make complete sense to me. Um, 
are you, when you're doing that, this work, Jabu, are you, you know, when you say you're currently reviewing that, um, are you, um, have you, are you in some way reaching out to people who have that expertise or do you feel you have uh, it amongst yourselves? Uh, yes. So Commissioner Comerford um, is, is like leading this with one of the commissioners as well too. And she has been reaching out. Uh, she's a, I believe she teaches social work at UVM. So she's been reaching out to people within her network to, uh, to get input and feedback on um, 13.02 and 13.03. Um, our hope is that maybe as I have a working draft, uh, I don't think for our next meeting, but for the May meeting. Um, but that was the update I got last in our in our meeting last week. Okay. Um, so I guess maybe that would be maybe that would be the way to go with that one, Soraya. Is just simply that um, um, I don't know that we necessarily need to, you know, that sort of relates to eight point one point one, which is. We don't need to form a committee unless we know that that would be helpful, given the fact that we have a department that is in a reasonable amount of flux, and we don't know who the person is that would, whether that person would need, would feel that committee was helpful. Um, so um, in, in the meantime, um, we know that um, the police commission is working on those directives as they relate to people with um, diminished capacity, persons with disabilities. Um, and that might relate to the second, let's see, the next one, which is, um, I mean, this could be, it's interesting, I hadn't really thought about this, but the, um, uh, in, again, in the meantime, before there is some sort of a committee, the community, the mental health summit could include this robust community forum, um, which is on 8.2.2, um, and, and specifically talk about police policy um, or police re policy review. Um, uh, but perhaps it would be best for the police commission to do the work first. And then that could be put to a group of people that are, um, have that experience. Although it sounds like you're doing a lot of that outreach as well. So I'm not really sure if that would be an unnecessary step. Um, I don't know if others if others feel differently. If that is maybe just where maybe to just simply say that this is all part of of eight point two point one and eight point two point two are to some degree similar in the sense that you know in the meantime before there is a committee um, that the police commission on its on their own is currently reviewing those directives and. Um, and taking the lead on that. Um, I'm not sure really, really, I don't know if we really need to say anything more than that. Does anyone feel differently? Was that a this, Soraya? Yes. That was a, a this. Thumbs up. Okay, all right. Too bad you don't have, we don't have one of those that you can put in your little screen. Maybe you do, do they? I can't remember. Um, now, um, as far as, um, Ensure a coordinated approach with policy review, telecommunications, EMS. Um, uh, when you are doing the directive review, Jabu, do you know if that will include other, you know, other public safety, or does it include other public safety? Sorry, um, I'm not. I'm not I'm I'm not part of that, like, like the two person group that's, look, that's overlooking that. So I can't say for exactly whether it is or not, but I can absolutely get back to you on that. But okay. Probably within like the hour. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, why don't we move on in that, in that case? So um, uh, this is a, a training 
The next one is a training um, item, um, which is prioritize sufficiently scenario-based training, particularly for de-escalation strategies and responding to individuals in crisis. Um, ensure evaluations are written for each, uh, for each officer as part of the evaluation. Um, so, um, Chief, you feel that that is already being done. Is that right? This is 8.3.1. Yes, I, I do. I, I think that, as I said, uh, the evaluations are verbal, but we are doing this. This is a component of our both our ICAT training, our patrol procedures training, uh, and our uh, crisis response training. Uh, it is also a component of actual events where after action reviews are, are pretty common for uh, large scale critical events um, for officers to take time to, to think about response. It's often conducted either, either immediately after the incident once everything has been stabilized and people are what we call 10-8 or uh, free again to take calls um, or it is conducted sometimes the next shift uh, or during the next roll call when the members who were present for the incident will be available. Um, and uh, it's, it's an integral part of the, of the learning process for, for anything that involves a, uh, a large scale response. Um, but it's part of training and, and others. And if, if uh, Detective Byrne is still on, he is uh, intimately involved in uh, both our, uh, our training and uh, I think he can concur or describe. Yeah, we're all, always doing scenario-based training. There the last couple of weeks we've been doing patrol procedures and we've been putting officers through scenarios uh, for how they would respond to certain incidents. So yeah, we, we do a lot of scenario-based training. Um, can, can you can you can you can you also speak um, or into the 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 next item where you talk about um, the recommendation of of research and connecting with other like police department who departments who've incorporated scenario based training? Uh, um, are you are you already doing that? Uh, not that I'm aware. No, well, we do all our training uh, by ourselves. I like guess part of BPD. I don't know of any. Uh, connection outside of people at the department teaching at the academy. I'm not sure of any. So I'm just catching up on the on the point. Yeah. Of, uh, if I may offer a clarification, so our patrol procedures, excuse me, our ERU team is in talks with VSP and with uh, federal partners to bring uh, different tools learned at the federal level, including uh, the FBI's HRT and talk about that. We have cross-trained with the VSP on certain kinds of uh, crisis response. Um, and the, the notion of the scenario-based training, that part, as Oren says, we have actually set the model for this at the state level via the police academy for the past couple of years, for the past several years, really. And although we are, despite being staffed, we're currently 38% total down, I'm more than 50% down on patrol. I am still sending officers down to the police academy, uh, even though we only had one in the previous academy, we only have one in the current academy. Uh, it's because I want what we do here to be disseminated and shared in the state. And there are there is no other entity, not, not even the state police, that responds to the kinds of events that these officers do with the skill and, uh, and tactics that they do. The work that was done on Saturday morning at two in the morning when two individuals were shot in the parking garage was absolutely exemplary. We had officers rushing into that scenario when people were, we still did not know the location of the gunman. The officer immediately began rendering aid, put a, a chest seal on an abdominal wound that in all likelihood saved the individual's life, gave uh, incredibly, effective communication to that individual and the other individual who was shot in an extremity, a communication that was clear to the point, was caring and was investigatory, uh, reassuring and was, was getting at needed information, uh, was able to effectively uh, it de-escalate an overwrought crowd that was pushing in. And the kids who were part of that crowd, young people, high school seniors, 
why they were out at 2 a.m. on a Friday night uh, uh, is, is up for grabs, but there they were. They were met uh, in the uh, apparent and, and some of those ch kids who were witnesses came to the police department uh, later that night, early that morning and three in the morning, four in the morning, and frankly told officers that what they had seen had completely changed their opinion about policing, about the nature of, of what these officers do and, and will do and, and will put themselves at risk for. Uh, the fact that, that Officer Noah who has showed up with, with purple gloves and a rifle and immediately slung that rifle behind his back in order to administer that seal. Uh, totally, uh, that was, that's the kind of work that the officers in this department get to do not in a, in a good way. We don't get to do it like we're, but we are privileged to get to do it and do it well at a rate that other police departments simply don't. And that's why I continue to send officers down to the police academy, despite the fact that it makes zero sense from a resource deployment standpoint. Okay, thanks so much, Chief. Um, Milo, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I think often about regarding de-escalation is also the concept of not inadvertently causing an escalation. And at times we've had some difficult conversations around how certain incidents could have been handled differently. So I guess I would like to see a plan or see how something is incorporated um, in order to, to help officers avoid inadvertently escalating a situation. Um, so that would be my, my comment on uh, this particular item. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Milo. Um, so I'm not really sure where to go with this. It sounds to me like um, scenario-based training is being done and at least from what I gather is being done very well. Um, so I think that, I think, I think that uh, it sounds like scenario-based training is being prioritized. I mean, sufficiently is a judgmental is a judgment term, but um, I think that you know the perhaps the best committee conclusion is you know we've heard this we've heard this from the chief and that you know always that always the uh, you know the primary goal is to. Um, assure safety and the de-escalation um, is always a priority with the training and when officers respond. That seems, I don't know, do others have a, I don't know, Zariah, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I did write down the note that we're not specifically doing this on 8.32, but generally have in our department exchange through the police academy. Um, and I would generally recommend, or sorry, would generally say that any improvements are maybe low given that the department feels it's currently sufficient. And I did highlight them to still for all this into training um, so that, yeah, we can collect all the training recommendations and BPD can come up with their, that plan. Okay, great. Um, Let's try to move on here. Um, so, I, I, unless I'm anyone sorry. else has anything, go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I I just would just given some of those incidents where where officers have inadvertently escalated their situations. I am curious if there are scenarios that help train for that. Um, and I guess I would like to see that mentioned in in the notes. Well, what would you like to, uh, what what would you, what would, well, I understood like, I think, I think you're saying, sorry Mila if I'm understanding you correctly is saying like maybe generally scenario based is being done sufficiently but could we be doing more specifically around um non-escalation 
Right. So not getting to the point where you have to, it's like sometimes they come into a situation where they have to de-escalate, right? Because the situation is already is already hot or has the potential to be hot. So you want to work with an individual to kind of keep things calm so you can resolve, come to a positive result if possible, whenever. But uh, how, do, how do officers think about um see it's really hard i have i have examples but it's really hard because because i can't really say right well a couple of them have actually been public but it's 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 what what training is is done to say okay you this is how you de-escalate but are there specific scenario training to avoid escalations? Right. Does, am I making sense? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. Let's, um, this is another, this is another uh, BPD training item, curriculum development should be prioritized for all BPD training, lesson plans, visual aids, et cetera. Um, I think there was broad agreement for that. Um, uh, Milo had said, agree, would like more information on current trainings. Um, uh, Chief Hewitt said the current training already incorporates these aspects. That would, I mean, that would seem to make sense to me. Um, that you would have that if you're if you're doing curriculum development that um, you'd have all of these things would go along with that in terms of lesson plans, visual aids, and all the others. Um, uh, I mean, this is I maybe we could say we you know we all we all agree with that. Um, not really sure what else to really say. Um, I, I agree with you, Karen. I think it's, it's it seems like it's being done, and we kind of checked that one off the box there. Yeah. Does anyone disagree? Okay. All right. Um, so the next, so I guess what we can say on that one, Soraya, is that you know the committee the committee's conclusion is that you know that that is a priority, and that based on um, current training um that those aspects are being integrated um you know i mean i i think i think for i mean i'm taking the chief's word for that 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 is already being done and i haven't heard any disagreement in terms of particularly coming from the police commissioner so i'm inclined to think that 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 is the case great uh, sorry and i'm also referring back to you that everybody remembers one point 42.1 which was to get that like a better understanding of current training okay so maybe that should be put into that you know that um um on a i don't know a quarterly basis that there would be a discussion at the police commission um where current training was 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 recapped discussed and you know, I think we got into that in section one in terms of a listing of who has been to what training. Yeah, um, we said twice a year to police commission, once a year to counselors. Okay, all right, Milo, did you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I was actually um, just going to follow up on exactly what was just said that this is in line with that other request. Just overall, looking at transparency and training. Training is. A, a huge issue across our country right now, how officers are being trained um, so that they can uh, be more effective in the community and also be building trust um, and reducing a negative use of force incidents. So I just, the transparency of the training is is really important and 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 having access to what is being trained and documents that are being used for training, I think is really important. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so the the next recommendation 
and I'm not really sure where to go with that one either. It's the utilizing the statewide steering community um, to assess what is already um, operational in terms of mental health training in other communities in Vermont, and then begin discussions regarding how pooled resources. I mean, the, all of these make sense. I'm not really sure how um, you know workable they are in terms of you know being something that we can do or not do. We could always recommend it. I assume that there's a statewide ability to do that, but it certainly is beyond our scope, it would seem. Um, maybe that would be, I don't know if that, if others feel that that might be the best thing is to simply say, yeah, we agree with that. Everyone agreed. It's not exactly a huge priority, but were this to, um, that we could certainly express that we agree with this and encourage um, BPD to, um, to advocate for it. That might be enough. Makes um, sense. Okay. Um, anyone else have anything on that one? Just want to try not to take up too much time on things that are really out of our purview so we can yeah. get on, get on to the good stuff. Um, it, it is out of our purview, but I think it is something that uh, BPD needs to advocate for, police commission and the city council needs to advocate for because this issue is just going to be with us for a while. And, and, you know, we're going to be looking at trying to improve because we know these numbers have gone up significantly, even though other incidents have, re have gone down. Um, it's just something that all eyes need to be on in a more conscious way. And the state needs to really be a more, um, I guess, active participant in understanding what officers are, are facing, you know, in the street on a day, on a, you know, day-to-day -day basis and also how it's affecting residents and how it's affecting businesses, um, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Um, just trying to take some notes here. Um, sorry. Um, all right. So the the next then um, the next item is also about surrounding communities. Um, this is surrounding communities um, who are currently implementing or researching CIT, such as Hartford and Montpelier. Um, as recommended in section one, BPD should consult with team two statewide coordinator. Um, uh, according to the chief, this is already being done. This is um, that there is the, this exact recommendation. It, appear, it appears as though this exact recommendation is already being done. Is that is that fair to say, chief? It is in the sense of uh we are going to team two um and we are uh working with i i have spoken to chief pete about the different trainings that they're doing um and we are uh, investigating obtaining and providing cit okay um did you want to add something on that milo i know you had said that you wanted to um that you wanted more information on the work with Montpelier and Hartford, does this sort of answer your question, or did you did you have more that you wanted to hear? Um, I guess on some of these things, where I, I guess I wanted to have an understanding on more details in terms of what they were working on, and. So we have a determination if it's something that we incorporate or pursue, or are we already ahead of the game, um, depending on what the case may be. And what is team two? Just to throw in a question. What is team two? T2 
Team Two is a statewide training that uh, it gives officers resources that they can refer people to, talks a little bit about de-escalation techniques and how to approach people in crisis, uh, and then acts as a coordinating umbrella for uh, different kinds of services. Um, its, its functionality is, uh, I, think it, it's a, I think it's a good program. Uh, Detective Byrne attended it. Detective Byrne actually won an award in our most recent award ceremony. Uh, for an act in, in 2020 in which he uh, used Team 2 training and ended up in their newsletter as an example of, of how the training does work and the kinds of, of conduct that it can engender. But I think that the, um, the advent of the CSL program takes away a lot of, or, or sort of uh, performs in a better way a lot of what Team 2 is designed to help other agencies achieve, which is uh, a cognizance of available services and an ability to refer people to them. Um, so we are nevertheless continuing to send officers to it. It's the closest thing that Vermont has to CIT, uh, which has been proven elusive for uh, obtaining. Um, and uh, I think I've, I think a total of about 30 employees from the BPD have gone through team two out of our current uh, out of our current 65, but it's not all uniforms. There are also uh, people who are dispatchers have gone through team two. I am sending at least one or two CSLs down to team two in May. Um, so we're sending a large contingent. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um... All right, so it sounds like that, you know, as I say, I mean, it, it certainly sounds like this is being done and being done um, uh, that really takes advantage of Team 2. Um, and uh, um, I'm not really sure if we really need to go any further than that on this one. Um, Can I ask one follow-up question? I'm sorry, this is course. more about my understanding sure. than on the report. Um, does that mean that CSOs will also be joining in team two going forward or is it really for sworn officers? Sworn CSLs, CSOs and dispatchers. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, there's another one that relates to team, the team Team two, which is the um, two from, well, 8.4.4. But in terms of 8.4.3, um, sounds like there is broad agreement on this. Um, investigating, obtaining, and providing CIT training with neighborhood agencies. Um, uh, so again, I mean, it, it sounds it sounds like this is. I mean, we all agree. The question is whether or not um, whether or not that's a, a high priority. We sort of have gotten off of that. Most people felt that it was a, a pretty high priority. Um, uh, oh, sorry. So is this something? It, um, uh, uh, so it sounds like you are already, or maybe were because of this investigating, um, this chief, is that, is that right? Was this in response to the CNA report or was this something that you were already looking into before that? And, um, you know, certainly based on what, on, on, what is your opinion as to how much of a priority this would be? It's a training priority. As I said, you know, uh, Detective Byrne won an award for going to Team 2 last year. He, that act happened in 2020 before this happened. We've been sending officers to Team 2 for quite some time. Um, I have been seeking CIT training since uh, since I was a deputy chief uh, and have been attempting to identify it. We have not been able to find it. Um, so, uh, I had Lieutenant Justin Kucher when he was the administrative Lieutenant looking for it. He couldn't, 
Uh, I've asked Lieutenant Labarge to look into it. It's uh, our, our training coordinator. Um, it has proven elusive. Uh, hmm. But it is things that we, these are ideas and things we've been working on for quite some time. Well, then based on that, maybe the, maybe the committee conclusion is that we all agree that this is a priority um, and, um, and would simply recommend that the, the department continue on the, on the trajectory that it is in, in prioritizing it and figuring out a way to make it happen. Um, the, uh, actually I have a quick question. Sure. Um, Chief, have you ever approached NACOL about information to see if they could make any recommendations? No, I have not. I have talked with other entities like PERF and uh, the networks that I have among chiefs through the Police Executive Research Forum and IACP. Uh, NACOL is a civilian oversight body. It's not a mental health training provision. Um, I, I do understand that they're a civilian oversight body, but because mental health issues are so important and are coming up everywhere um, in civilian oversight, it could, they do so much. They, they track so many things. Um, that are related to the issues that come up in civilian oversight. So um, I'll, uh, I'll look into that uh, using our NACOL contacts to see what, if they have any recommendations. Thank you. Okay, that would be good. That, that's actually a, that's a, that's actually a uh, um, good because it's a, uh, so more workable and a little more proactive um, than, you know, and it's always great when there's suggestions on next steps. Um, so that would be, uh, let's see, that is 8.4, uh, 8.4.3, um, 8.4.4. Um, I think this is also part of the same yeah. Mm -hmm. This is part of the same thing. This is, in fact, I even said same as above. I think we all sort of agreed. We probably could just simply put that from 8.4.2 uh, 8 and 8.4.1. These are all related. They're all in the 8.4 list of recommendations. So I'm not sure if we need to really go into that again. Um, the... Um, when we get into 8.5, um, this is, let's see, in light of COVID-19, there's been a significant increase in e-learning training, um, including on mental health. There is often a per officer charge, um, size of Burlington make this a good solution to consider. Um, this um, is, a, is another training item. Um, this could be literally, a uh, copy and paste into the training tab. Um, it, it simply is a, a recommendation that, I mean, it's more of, I guess, to some degree, an observation. Um, not sure how important it is. I mean, obviously, it's more of a cost saving thing. Um, but I'm not really sure how much of a cost saving it is because you've got to do the work to find it. Um, so I don't know if others feel that this is not a a screamingly, a screaming, a screamingly important um, priority given all the other many priorities that we've got. Anybody feel agree. anything about that? that? Low on the list. Okay, so Zarai on on uh, on um, uh, line uh, what is it? Eight point five point two. Or actually, wait a minute. Maybe I skipped one. Did I skip one? No. Yeah, I did. Actually, I did. Sorry about that. So 8.5, I got ahead of myself. So 8.5.2, that line could just simply be cut and pasted into the training tab. Um, as far as 8.5.1, um, in recruit orientation, annual in-service and refresher training, recommended whenever possible for committees 
or for communities to include a site visit to key community resources like drop-off centers, scenario-based training. This is also another training issue. Um, and I think there was agreement on this, though not as high a priority. Well, it was a high priority for some. Um, that might be something that could be, if there's a suggested timeline, could maybe be like a Q3 or something. Um, and it sounds like that is already being done. Um, I don't know, for either for Milo or Jabu, have you in your police commission work, has this has this come up in terms of like a, a report to you on this type of work? Um, you know, including site visits to community resources? Because I think it's a great idea. Have you heard about that? Yeah, go ahead, Jabu. Uh, not within the Police Commission, but I did do the Community Academy when I first joined the Police Commission. That was offered, I think, uh, anyway, uh, pre-pandemic. And then that, that it, is uh, it is discussed, uh, time division. A, a, lot, a lot of stuff in there is discussed. Okay. Um, so I think, I mean, personally, I think chief that this is something that could really be highlighted as something that, um, the officers are doing. I think it's, I think people need to hear about this kind of thing. Um, uh, because, you know, people just don't know. Um, and I would hope that that might be something that, um, perhaps when you have a PIO that you might be able to highlight as well. Um, uh, all right, so let's see. All right, so the next item would be, um, uh, that BPD should mandate all officers receive a higher standard of training rather than having a full patrol based on specialized response. Um, and that would be, um, it seemed as though everyone agreed. Hannah, unfortunately, had to leave us and had, they did come up with, they did have a comment about our connections to all community resource based nonprofits made between BPD. Um, you know, I guess, um, the question would be um, either to Chief or Detective Byrne, how do you go about that, in, that kind of engagement with um, you know, officers and strong community resources? How, how do you go about fostering that? Um, Oren, do you want to give like specific examples of that, of how that factors in, for example, in FTO? Because many of these are components of, of FTO. Um, the idea of, of connecting with, uh, understanding how we work with our mental health partners, of how we work with other partners like STEPS, et cetera. Um, and uh, the, the notion that we are, that we learn on a day-to-day -day basis as well what partners are available to us out there. Yeah, um, just trying to remember back now to FTO, all the things that my FTO has brought me to is just kind of standard in what I bring FTOs to. You know, we, we bring up to the hospital and make sure that they know this is your first line resource for a crisis. We make sure that they're on first name basis with all of our um, uh, outreach team, they go into dispatch so they understand how call, certain calls are prioritized and uh, dispatched out so they have a, a working understanding of that. Uh, they're brought to act so they know where that is, where they can assess that. Um, yeah, all, all that uh, kind of stuff happens on FTO. That happened eight years ago when I was on FTO and when I have trainees, I I make sure uh, my the, the people I'm training uh, understand uh, these resources and how they work. Um, yes, far as yeah, no, I can leave it at that. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, so there's agreement on this. 
um, that all officers should um, receive a higher standard of training rather than having a full patrol based um, a specialized response. Um, and uh, um, I think there's just broad agreement for, th for that. Um, consequently, having well-trained officers with strong community resources is an important component to have. As we all know, things can go poorly on a call in a matter of minutes. This is not always preventable, but the more training resources, alternatives to police response um, and specialized police response, the better the likelihood of a positive outcome. So what I would also input on this, Soraya, is on, um, you know, just the involved in inclusion, you know, very soon of the cahoots response. Um, so it would just, it would not just simply be training for BPD, but also the fact that there would be a specialized um, alternative um, that would hopefully increase the likelihood of a positive outcome. That's what I, that's what I would say. Um, and I'm not sure that's a, there's a suggested timeline, except that hopefully that will happen by the third quarter of, um, of 22. Um, yeah, on a lot of the training ones, I'm putting TPD just because we talked about that map and prioritizing. So I don't know if we wanna, or at least in section one, we had said that we would leave those decisions to be BP, TBD based on how we, yeah. how the overall model comes out. Okay. Um, the um, city of Burlington and BPD should conduct a thorough assessment of the ecosystem of Burlington and state of Vermont, which will be required to develop a roadmap and specialized response um, mandated or voluntary. Um, I didn't really have a comment on this. I, I don't know if others agreed. Um, not really sure where to go with that. These things that go beyond, you know, go beyond uh, Burlington and start talking about the state of Vermont, that sort of loses me because I'm just not really sure what the purview is there. Um, and I didn't really get the recommendation. Maybe others got that a little bit better than I did. I, I didn't really understand it. Um, let's see. I mean, it sounds like, I don't know to what extent team two does this, but it sounds like it's just saying, make a map of what resources there are. Maybe that's not um, true. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think with all the things that we've got going on, this seems to be a pretty low, I would think this is a pretty low priority. I know Jabu gave it a three. Um, these are things that just sort of, I don't know, don't seem to be, I'm not saying they're not important. I'm just saying that in the scheme of things, they don't seem as much of a priority. I think overall there's a, there, there's a general need that, you know, being the, the largest city population base in the state, having some pretty unique um, issues in the Northwestern part of the state, right? We are, um, I always talk about the fact that we are, are even though Vermont is still one of the whitest states in the country, there is rapid diversification in our, our corner of the state um, that brings up a lot of additional issues. And I think that, yes, it's something to be looked at long-term, but not to be buried because I, I don't think it's, I think it's important for the state to really be communicating with with Burlington um, and even Winooski on some things because Winooski sees a lot of things that Burlington also sees. So, um, and I think these will trend in the rest of the state. Uh, so yeah, I think it's something that ultimately needs to happen uh, just based on the, the, the population base here and in our surrounding uh, communities because what's happening here 
goes out to the surrounding communities and eventually to the rest of the state. Thank you. Mm. It's like the ecosystem, what I was thinking of is just not uh, the things and the programs, but I was thinking of the people as well. I was just incorporating all of that. Thanks. Okay. Um... All right. Um, so I guess the conclusion is that, you know, that, that this this is important, certainly not a top priority, given all the many other priorities we have, um, uh, but certainly is important, given the fact that our ecosystem, um, you know, is uh, is similar to others, particularly Winooski, which I would tend to agree with um, the the next one is very similar it talks about ensuring that the training roadmap, it includes mandated training for all officers, refresher training, um, you know, uh, and let's see, I think I lost a little bit of it. Um, uh, recognizing and responding to mental health and behavioral calls for service while still keeping skills refreshed moving forward. Um, not really sure what that means, Chief. What, what, is, what is Vermont Rule 13? Rule 13 is the uh, state's direction for what annual training must occur in order for an officer to be recertified as a level three police officer on an annual basis. Okay, and this, and this is included in that training? Uh, yes, uh, the, the notion that, you know, that there's a training roadmap with mandated training and specialized advanced level training. Um, Yes, and we discussed this at length with uh, with CNN. This section has a lot that is clearly boilerplate, and it is not designed merely for Vermont. There are incredible misreadings of how we interact between the PSAPs and dispatch. Uh, there are misunderstandings of how the criminal justice system works here with regard to officers transporting to correctional facilities and what the relationship is there. Uh, there's the repeated use of the term commander for the police department. Uh, there's mention of things that, uh, that are happening. Um, the, for example, in the recommendation section uh, about, the, about CIT, long description of CIT, and then in the recommendations, they drop in team two, which is Vermont and comes from some of the discussions, but it isn't re referenced at all in the body. It's just sort of included in, in a recommendation. Um, it, this, this, there are aspects to this part that are uh, that are things we're already doing, and I do think that it's an example of uh, a sense that that this section a little bit less than others, uh, excuse me, a little bit more than others. This section a little more than others was was written in a general way and not specific. Okay. Um... All right, so it looks as though, um, Zariah, on, on 8.7.2 and 8.7.3, that these are both training and required trainings, that those are done because they have to be. They're mandated. Um, I don't know that we really need to spend a lot of time on those. Um, the, um, let's see. Uh, as far as if there's no budget um, allocated, for I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, so refresher training, is that mandated? Is refresher training mandated? Right, because it said mandated training and then it has refresher training separate. Because we've come across some incidents where we've talked about um, various, I, I mean, part of it is 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 mental health, um, uh, dealing with people with diminished capacities or things that are indicates mental illness, but there's also things that have come up with regards to juveniles. So I guess I look at mandated and refresher training to be separate things. And I have, I think we've, and, and Jabu, you can um, back me up here, but I think it's fair to say that in our discussions, 
um, between the department and the police commission that there have been some things that we've been concerned that um, need refresher or need to be re-reviewed in some way. So um, I guess I wouldn't assume that because considering refresher to be different from mandating that this is something that's being done. Well, when you say mandating um, or that it, it must be done, I mean, in order to continue to have the certification, you have to do the training. That's what I'm understanding. So there's no, you know, there's no wiggle room here. Either you do it or you are not a level three officer. So I would imagine they're doing it because that's what they do. Yeah, uh, but I guess I, I, uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard not to know because I, I, I have to admit, I don't know the history of every single officer in terms of how long they've been and exactly what their training was. I will say that there's issues where there are uh, certain things that, um, I have a deep concern where certain policies, procedures, directives, rules aren't there, there aren't adequate refreshers for them. Okay. Um, well, uh, if, you know, if you, if, if, as we, if, we agree, um, Zariah, I mean, certainly that could be integrated into the community's conclusion, which is, or the committee, yeah, the, not community, committee, the committee's conclusion that um, certainly mandated, um, and then how would you, how would you word that, Milo, in terms of concern, the concern that you have, how, how would you how Can I take a that? stab at it, if that's okay? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, I'm again saying like C 1.4, 2.1, because again, I think we want to get all the training stuff into one place and prioritize it there. And so I think for this one saying like, note the emphasis on refreshers in this note and review the need to prioritize that beyond mandates or something like that. Okay, how does that sound, Milo? I'm comfortable with that. Thank you. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, uh, I think that I think we I think we have ourselves a pretty straightforward one with 8.7.4 because it says if there's no budget budget allocated for CIT training, consider allocating the funds. Um, the reality is the funding is available. So that, um, and I know Milo had said you strongly agree, although may not be possible for a while, uh, do, you know, due to staffing issues. It sounds to me, um, you had said, Chief, that you have serious resource-based concerns about being able to put all officers through 40 hours of training, including CSO, CSLs. Um, when you say that you have serious resource-based concerns, is that funding or people or both? Both, but primarily people at this stage. Okay. Um, so even if you had people, you, you do at least feel that you have sufficient funding um, to continue to continue that is that I have not because I have not been able to find the training I don't know how much the training will cost however the bigger issue is losing I have an officer for example who had this training in in Colorado for she got 40 hours of training um, uh, for me to administer 40 hours of training to all of the personnel when we are staffed the way we are is a virtual impossibility Certain and and it may be a it may be a monetary impossibility as well, particularly if it requires travel. Um, mm -hmm. 
but uh, there, there may or may not be train the trainer programs that are available whereby we pay more for one or two officers to attend a longer program. Uh, uh, are you interested, Oren? Um, and then have them uh, return and, and deliver that training to others. Uh, but that too has, has resource implications, uh, both from a monetary standpoint, if I have to travel them and pay for them to, to live someplace for probably more than 40 hours, train the trainer would probably be more on the order of, of 60 to 80 hours. Um, but right now, the bigger impact is not the money, it is losing two officers from the road for a week or two weeks in the case of a train the trainer program. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, th those are hypotheticals. I know that CIT training takes up to 40 hours uh, in, in some locations. Again, that was described by an officer here who has had the training, but not the train the trainer version. Um, and uh, she she's, uh, you know, good. I think that she, she really enjoyed the program and thought it was worthwhile. Um, the, uh, the question is where we would, so where we'd find it or not. If I, if I did find it to have, this is another reason why, for example, I, I would like bike patrols to return, but bike patrol for an officer takes uh, at least a week and up to two weeks of bike training. So the officers use, use the bikes in a policing capacity. Um, and I can't spare officers for that long a period of time away from a patrol or their normal, or their normal uh, tasks. So that's what I mean by uh, serious resource-based concerns and being able to put all officers, CSOs, CSLs, and ECS through 40 hours of training. Okay, all right, Th thanks for that explanation. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. No, I, I would just say that, you know, we're just so short-staffed that we just don't have the ability to, to spread our force so, so thin here. Um, it'd be nice, but once we're back to full staffing, um, then I think this could be considered, but not, probably not, a, not until then. Okay, I think they're saying that, thank you. I think there tends, sounds like there is pretty, um, Milo had said something along that, that, you know, strongly strongly agree, although it may not be possible at this time. So that would be something, um, that is a training item, but that would again, Zariah go into that training bucket for the same reason. Um, the, um, I wasn't really sure why this next one is listed here. Uh, because it's going back to um, auditing um, body cam footage before and after each shift, including identified for having a mental health component. Um, you know, I mean, I know for myself, I thought that was a lot, um, just an awful lot. And even if that's even possible to do, is that a, um, you know, is that something that is, I mean, is that something that's even really doable? I mean, do any departments, um, in your in your experience, um, Chief, does, do any departments do this? Audit Karen, body cam footage? Karen, if I can cut in again. Sure. I, yeah, I don't, I know that I took, I remember now, I was here for this because I remember we had a long discussion on this and I remember Oren specifically bringing up concerns on like, like for um, employee rights that they, you know, that it's negotiable in the contract, but that folks felt like they should have. And I know we took notes on this, so I don't know, like I'll try to yeah. find them again, make sure that I get those to Jared again. Um, but I think the appropriate thing to do here is to refer us back to that section saying like, consider having, I think we're, with the conclusion that we came to, even though it's not in our current notes is to consider having there be more reasons to review body cam footage, but it's still not being random or all of yeah. or everything. And anybody correct me if they feel like that's not correct. No, I think that is what we discussed and we did have a long discussion. I thought it was in section one, but it might've been in section two or three. It was, it was early section on. Four. Section four, all right. I guess it wasn't as early as I thought. I've, I can't really remember. Um, we, um, let's see, one, two. Right, I did go back and I found three, four, and five. So I know that we do have those in the minutes. Oh, great. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd hate to lose something here. That would really be a bummer. 
Um, so sorry, Jared, you said that you do have the notes for four because I remember taking those. Yes, I do have the okay. notes for four. Great, then I won't try to find them. <laughs> You know, and this the other one also, I feel like, Soraya, sort of goes back the incorporating, defining de-escalation into use of force documentation. I mean, the, I'm not really sure why this is here. Um, it, you know, and well, in fact, actually, thank, thankfully, somebody did go back. The chief went back. It's on 6.4, I mean, 4.3.2. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is the same, as I say, I'm not really sure why, um, you know why this is here um and maybe you know maybe it was something that just was put in to make sure that that point was covered um the other oh, yeah no the chief is yeah. right it's 1.33.1 so you're both yeah. right section one. Oh, is it okay um I'm not really sure we need to spend an awful lot of time on that we have a couple of items that are um related to uh court diversion um court liaison um uh that sort of sort of lost me a little bit um uh recommendation oh good so so jabu you thought this was a good recommendation 8.9.1. Um, um, so what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, no, I mean, I'm always for trying to keep people, kind of, trying to keep people, trying to keep people out of jails, and it's seems kind of like um, court diversion s kind of process here. So, anything that kind of keeps people outside of jail and kind of like reducing that kind of harm that that does on on like uh, people's lives, I think that's a great idea. And I mean, how we go about actually implementing that, I think that's another that's another question, but. Uh, I mean, yeah, it seems like this is kind of not really a BPD purview thing. <clears throat> My understanding is that um, it's district attorneys and uh, state attorneys that kind of um, kind of uh, determine whether you, you, they push for jail time, those kind of things like that. So I don't know how we get this information to the DAs of the state, but yeah. Yeah, these were... These ones that are sort of beyond our purview sort of got me, um, sort of left me not really knowing how to, because I felt like that, I felt I agreed that they were, they're good, but are they, you know, how much of an, how much do we have to say about that? Go, go ahead, Jeff, please. No, I would, I would agree with Jabu. I, I think, you know, if, if uh, for whatever crime might've been committed, if you could do court diversion, I think a mandatory job training program you know, if you don't want people to repeat their crimes, I mean, to get them trained into something and, and make them a, uh, a valuable member of society to have a job, I think it would be a, a good opportunity um, to try to incorporate that. So maybe this is another one where we can really just say that, you know, obviously this is beyond, beyond our immediate purview, but certainly the city supports um, any, um, any, you know, any jail-based diversion um, and care coordinated programs that keep, that keep people um, out of prison and give them resources to be able to, um, you know, build successful lives. Um, I think that might be the way to, and maybe, and maybe the way to deal with the, um, the other, um, you know, I think, I think, I think that's probably why we're sort of all going a little bleary eyed because they're, they're, they're deep um, and they're important, but they're not something that we have purview over. Um, I know like Jabu, you had said, see above. I said the same thing because they're basically about, they're very similar. Um, so that would bring us to 8.9.2. 
determining a court liaison would be a useful part of a robust diversion. Um, uh, Same thing. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fortunately, with the CSLs, um, we do have justice involved case management um, uh, in 8.9.3. Um, I didn't look at it that way, but um, can see. So, um, so as far as the um, CSLs, this is a direct. This is a part of their job description. Is that right, Chief? No, it's a part of their function. Our job descriptions don't include this language because this is not written for Burlington. So um, I think that the, uh, I mean, this is written for a, a different state structure with regard to, uh, you know, and, and even at the bottom, it talks about, for example, an officer or a deputy. This is, this is very broad language for any number of different clients of, uh, of the consulting company. Um, what I mean by the fact that this largely describes the CSLs and CAPE is the idea that what we have is it is justice involved case management in the sense that they are employees of the police department. They are coordinating on a daily and incident by incident basis with police officers. Um, and then what they are doing is they are attempting to divert individuals from having further police responses. Uh, they are, whether that is individuals who've shown incidents of, of mental health uh, or whether it is people who have experienced domestic violence um, the, the members of the CAPE team are, are primarily there to say, how do we prevent you from becoming another police incident, uh, whether as, a, as the complainant or as the person people are complaining about or the person who is complaining about things that the police cannot address. Uh, so that is the way in which it's a diversion from a criminal justice, but it's not a criminal justice response plan. I don't really know what that means. There, there's there's some language in this again that is not really about about us and and it, some of the def the definitions are unclear, but is it diversion from criminal justice? As in, does it prevent us from having to send somebody to either the prosecutor uh, at the state's attorney's office or, for that matter, even to the criminal? Uh, excuse me, to um, the the CJC and alternative justice? Yes, it it absolutely does. Okay, well, whether it's whether it's language specific to Burlington or not, it sounds like this work may not, I mean, it may not be worded as such, but it sounds like this work is being done, which is which is great. Um, uh, the um, uh, this um, having a clinician embedded in telecommunications um you know i i i didn't really know where to go with that i i see jeff you had said that who makes this decision doesn't sound like we make that decision um you know i mean i, I mean these are recommendations we don't need to necessarily have an opinion we can simply say that yeah, that's a great idea, but it's not within our purview to make that if we feel that way. Um, given all the other recommendations, I'm not sure that this is something, again, we can, like many of these other items that are in Section 8, we can say, yeah, we, we agree with that, we would advocate for that, but it is not our decision to do that, nor given the fact that there is a a financial component to this also. It's not really within our scope. Um, I know Milo had said need more info. What is the status of regional dispatch? What, um, what is the status, uh, Chief, of regional dispatch at this time? Uh, the board that was created to uh, put it up is still meeting on a semi-regular basis. There are uh, plans there continue to be plans for several municipalities in Chittenden County to join in a regional uh, dispatch center. And there is now state money that was not previously available because the state 
is attempting to divest its responsibility of PSAPs. Okay. Um, so I think this is the same kind of thing from one of, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Mila, go ahead, please. Um, thank you for that update. I kind of think in terms of now that we've had, we've increased the numbers of CSLs and um, hopefully we'll consider adding more. Um, I think as certain calls come through, my understanding is that um, some of these calls are coming through being directed in a way where a CSL might be sent out or CSL might be sent out with an officer or an officer might call in a CSL. Um, I think there seems to be a mechanism um, in place with regards to our calls that might need a CSL response. So I don't know if it ends up being, because I don't know if, um, I would like to think that other departments in the state we'll start to look at positions like that. I think we can think of a, any number of towns that could benefit from um, these positions. We hope to have more of them throughout the state. So it might be something where we, as a city, make a recommendation to those that are looking oh. at the overall um, regional plan. But I feel like it's something that we're, we're kind of doing already locally so okay um so again you know with 8.9.4 8 8.9. Point, um um you know i mean i think it's I think we. I think some of that is it, certainly some of it is going to be done when it comes to um, clinicians, not necessarily embedded in telecommunications, but certainly clinicians that will be responding, and that will be part of the Cahoots program that will be coming um, this summer. Um, we might be able to simply just say that, you know, um, this is something. Yes, that we are absolutely doing. Um, the uh, consider dedicated co-response team made up of combination of, um, I mean, I think the other is just simply the same with 8.9.5. Um, that's a lot of people responding um, or a co-response team, but that is to some degree the CAHOOTS model is that there would be a clinician, a social worker, um, specialized, um, you know, a specialized response that would include or could include people with lived experience. Um, and obviously they would be responsible to, it would be in coordination with UVMMC. So I think that would be, um, you know, I think that that to some degree is, is planned to be done. Um, so when the chief says consider, I think to some degree, a lot of it may be not as much, but a lot of this is um, where it says medications, you know, paramedics can assist with medication delivery. I mean, to some degree that is being done, I guess, but this is a long recommendation. Um, the... Um, see. We have just a couple left. Um, that would be, uh, um, 8.9.6, a traditional co-responder model, a clinician riding with an officer or deputy. Um, the, um, Seemed as though there was a lot of agreement on this. Um, to some degree, it will be done in some ways with 
um, the cahoots response. Um, and I think it, I mean, I think that could just simply be a conclusion that, yeah, we're working on that. Um, um, uh, Um, you know, although the, the cahoots response does not include a clinician writing with an officer or deputy, it only in, it includes a non-police response. So I'm not really sure quite where to go with that. Um, the police safety, public safety continuity plan did include the hiring of CSLs and CSOs. Um, so I think both of those working together would probably address this recommendation. Maybe not specifically, but in general. Does anyone else have any comments on this? We're, we're getting ourselves into the last uh, two, three, four, five, I think five recommendations. So we're almost there. Um, the, um, the one thing that I did see when we talked about 8.10.7 was the mobile crisis response team and that is about the CAHOOTS model. So that was sort of exciting to see that because that's really what that is talking about. Um, so um, I know Milo had mentioned that um, as well as I had said that. Um, so I think the committee's conclusion on that could simply be that yes, we are actively working on that RFP due April 1 um, and um, are hopeful, very optimistically hopeful of getting that on the street by, I don't want, I don't want to say a date, but I would say, I would say by the summer of 2022. That's a real, that's, that's realistic. I think, um, the, um, the other, we've got two, four, five, five to go. So the, the fifth to the last one is social service providers in the city of Burlington should submit clear scopes of their work and related budgetary needs to address staffing. Um, you know, I'm not really sure exactly what that meant. Um, and I know the chief had said not within BPD scope to this and the other, um, uh, as well as the, let's see. So in 8.10.1 and 8.10.2, um, did the reason you feel that way, Chief, is because this doesn't doesn't apply to Burlington, or because, or or why is it not within BPD scope? The Burlington Police Department can't make social service providers submit scopes of work and budgetary needs to the, to us or to the city for that matter. Um, I mean, I, I I don't disagree with this notion of what you you get from it, but we, I'm, I am not in a position, for example, to demand that Steps or Howard or or any number of other entities provide me their scopes of work and their budgets and their staffing and uh, their needs for additional resources, etc. This is not a police matter. This is something that that has, uh, you know, merit, but it's not within BBD's scope. Yeah, I know I wasn't really sure where to go with that. Um, anybody got any suggestions on our on two of our last five recommendations? Um, so, sorry, I was maybe not listening to what you said, Karen, but I'm going to try to answer what question I thought you may have asked anyway, which is okay. <laughs> <laughs> on 8.10.2, I wonder if that should be assigned to the city council. I think I'd agree with the chief that that's outside of the police department scope. Yeah, that's a that's if we want to carry it through, um, you know, and that could be part of that could be discussed as well at the mental health summit. I mean, we're going to have all these providers that are there maybe there would be an opportunity. They're all social service providers. Maybe there would be an opportunity for additional conversation. Um, so, I mean, what this is really sort of talking about is sort of sort of like what they 
It's sort of like what they do at community stat meetings, talking about resources, talking about who does what, um, uh, but they don't submit clear scopes of work. Um, that definitely does not happen at, at ComStat meetings. Um, so yeah, I mean, that could be a referral to the, the council, um, maybe on both of those items. Um, the uh, 8.1 or 8.11.1 was develop telecommunications specific CIT or include telecommunications in a 40 hour CIT. Um, so it sounds to me like that is in the works. Um, currently trained dispatchers in negotiation and crisis communications also send them to team two. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think that next step is actually it's actually a pretty good conclusion. What do you think? I'm sorry, was that for me? I, I... No, 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 no. I, I've actually, I actually, I actually, Chief was looking at your response to next steps on item 8.11.1, which is line 150. And what I had said was, I think that next step is actually, you know, is actually a very good conclusion that, um, you know, we agree that obviously dispatchers need to be trained in negotiating in crisis communication and sent to team two. Um, and as you said, when BPD is able to identify CIT training, the only thing that could be added to that would be, um, as Milo has suggested before, is that perhaps a resource would be NACOL to try to find that training. So that would be, I mean, that's my suggestion to all of you is that that is a reasonable way of putting in what the chief has said a next step could be, can be adapted. And I would support that being adapted as the committee's conclusion if others feel that, that way. Um, I'm supportive. I guess I'm curious as to the, because I don't know the regionalization thing. So is that something that's like it seemed like the chief was saying it was contingent on that and uh oh okay um and i don't know if it is contingent or if it's just like we're in a wait and see pattern is this contingent on some level of dispatchers being regionalized chief I don't know that it's contingent on it. I mean, I think in the short term, I have seven dispatchers when I'm supposed to have 12 and I'm not sending, I cannot send them to trainings at the moment. Uh, with regard to, you know, the issue of, uh, of asking for different kinds of training, et cetera, different things for them to do, if regionalization results in a more robust staffing model, which is its pitch, uh, then I think there's a lot more room to start asking for uh, new functions. So, you know, we're going to ask you to do this. We're going to ask that you uh, make certain that this call is diverted in X way or Y way, that you're entering new data into the call immediately, um, that it is extra work for you. At the time, for the time being, uh, I, I am loath to give extra work to overworked people. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I well, can yeah, continue I mean, my thought then. Um, yeah. yeah, I think then like many of them, it's like, I think this is a um, nice to have agree with the next step of finding criteria. And um, maybe we put this as a nice to have to look at again and 
year two or something else. Okay. Um, so we've got two more left, um, two long ones. <laughs> um, um, These are all, this is also a training, um, a training issue to a large degree. Um, uh, implemented this batch. Um, Can't really see the bottom of this. I don't know for whatever reason I can't get the bottom of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this one and the next one, the last two are. Um, they seem like a lot of a lot of work. Um, maybe the maybe the better way is just simply that um, at least at this point um, that um, that these are these are important um, but are fairly labor there it sounds like to, to me like they're very labor intensive um, and perhaps um, I mean the first one is more of an uh, more of an issue about um, uh, the, that it could be implemented you know as they regionalize um, and the second one is really a lot of you know a lot of a lot of work. Not really sure where to go with either one of them. There are our last two, probably. Probably we are both. Uh, I, I see a lot of eyes that are like, "Wow, okay, we are, we are in like the home stretch, people." Oh, I love to have everybody smile about that. Yes, we are in the home stretch. Two more to go. We can we can bring it home with these, and it's only seven seventeen. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Thanks. All right. Um, well, I didn't know where to put my comments, so I put it in the sidebar here. And you're probably not ex not wondering why I put this in, but we've discussed, you know, we never really, this report from so CNA never really addressed our needs, which you've heard about throughout this session. And thanks for putting up with me. But um, I really would like the final product to recognize that we've got some special circumstances downtown. We've got quality of life ordinances that we ought to, if we're going to have them on the books, we ought to do our best to enforce them and <clears throat> to recognize that it's going to take some resources to do this. And that in order to get the, for the police to understand how important it is to the city, that, you know, city council and commissioners really have to be behind this effort. So I hope you understand that this, we do have specific needs that, that ought to be addressed down here. So, and, 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 uh further my comments just we and you just recognize it karen there's an awful lot of work to do here if we're going to implement these um recommendations and so you know the budget i i hope would increase exponentially to you know put more offices on the force and staffing needs are going to grow um to to do this all correctly so um i i think everybody understands that so those are my final comments thanks Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Your your your. And by the way, I've enjoyed voice, working with everybody. What's that? What's that? I've enjoyed working with everybody. <laughs> um, thanks so thanks so much. I I'll I'll save that for as we walk out the door uh, virtually, so to speak. Go go ahead, Milo. Um, I would just like 
to remind my friend, Mr. Nick, that this is a holistic approach for the city of Burlington that does include the business community. And that in fact, some of the things that we've discussed, such as the cahoots model, I feel are going to be um, of huge help to the downtown area, as well as the rest of Burlington. And I just want him to continue to not, just to remember that all of Burlington has needs. And if we are following a holistic approach, then that's going to incorporate the downtown area, um, as well as the community um, and the greater business community throughout the city. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, uh, certainly, Jeff, your 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 comments have been heard and will be on there for the record, and um, and not just simply that it's a a list of recommendations and we come up with a report, but also that we implement them. So. We can't just talk the talk, we have to start implementing and walking the talk. Um, and I think doing that and doing it in a way that um, supports everyone, including the downtown, we, we need a downtown, we need a vibrant downtown, um, but also supports everyone else is the whole goal of this. Um, and certainly I believe the goal of the CNA report and recommendations. Um, to have a full and functional assessment and be able to move forward with that full and functional assessment. Um, so um, I think probably we can come up with some sort of a committee conclusion for 8.112 and 8.121. Um, probably was probably was being a little overly ambitious by trying to think that we could. Um, do all of section eight, but for the most part we have, um, which leaves us with basically a completed report and a lot more work to do in terms of integrating that. Um, that would be my only comment in the couple of minutes that we have left is that um, the, so Jared, if you can get the other section that includes whatever it is now, I'm sort of losing it, The I think three, four, and five, um, whether that I was- did email those to Zaria, and hopefully okay. she got them. But yes, I'm happy to work offline with either you, Karen, or her to make sure we get it all compiled together. Okay, so maybe, maybe after the meeting, we could spend a little bit of time. Um, uh, you probably have my number more easily than I have yours. If you want to go and if we can maybe just have 10 minutes before, you know, while it's still fresh in our minds. Um, I, um, I'm sure that uh, we all feel the same um, to Oren and to um, Detective Byrne, to the chief. Thank you so, so much for uh, what I believe is probably about 20 hours that we have put on Zoom in discussing uh, the recommendations of this report, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little, maybe a little bit more than 20 hours, but certainly a lot of time. And uh, to the commissioners, um, could not have done this without you. Thanks, Jeff, for agreeing to, to help um, to our two com police commissioners, Commissioner Grant and um, Gamash, uh, thank you so so much um i hope you feel i hope you feel that you've been that you were heard um you certainly i think you were um but i hope that you all feel that you were and um this will be captured for forever so um you know if there are other things that you think of in the next few days um that you were not completely covered or things you come to mind after I hope you'll let us know. Um, and uh, and of course, uh, Zariah, thank you very, very much. Um, couldn't have done this without you. It was, I know it's I know it's hard to say it's 730 after two and a half hours, but it wasn't so bad. <laughs> um, I do wonder, Jared, thanks for sending me three, four, and five. Sorry, I'm gonna do one more um, next step thing. Um, I know that 
someone, was that you, Jared, had been pulling out things that work with BPOA and for training? Was that you, Jared? I think originally uh, Councillor Paul had been putting those yeah. once we marked them. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, so maybe I'll volunteer. So maybe I'll go through <laughs> and make sure um, that we've pulled everything into appropriate tabs. If folks are okay with it, I might also go through and try to make a column that just makes it clear, kind of like the chief had where he said who's responsible and try to outline that between BPD, the police commission, the city council, um, just to make sure that we, and then pull that into columns. So just we each have our mar marching orders um, in one place instead of needing to look through the whole spreadsheet again, which I'm sure we all don't want to do anymore. Um, so maybe I'll take that on to try to make sure that I'm filling in any gaps that we have. Okay. And then none of us are allowed to look at an Excel spreadsheet for at least 24 to 48 hours. Um, this has been, this started as a pretty simple spreadsheet and it has become um, a, a pretty amazing document that we should all be incredibly proud of because there's a lot of work and we've got a lot of information on here. So um, the next steps are, you know, what Soraya had mentioned and then also, um, you know, the resolution called for a report back to the council. Um, I will, over the next couple of days, be working on, on that with the goal of trying to get that done by the 31st of March which would be the end of the council year. I will do my best to be successful with that. And then a draft will be, a draft will be forthcoming. Um, uh, if you think of anything else, you know, by all means, please call me. Um, I'm deeply grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, not that anybody is watching the clock, but it is 7.27. Um, and uh, I think unless there are any other items to address that we can be adjourned. Um, any other items? I don't think so. Um, great. Okay, have a, have a wonderful evening and uh, thank you again. Thanks so Thanks much, everyone. Bye. Really appreciate Bye. it. Yes, bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.